just give this a quick look see and double check it's working then we can start this video all right yeah it works it's a little on the quiet side though let's uh and loud in it So this video is about my KWA MP9 gas blowback submachine gun and diagnosing all the problems I've been having with it. So the symptom uh, of what I was having uh, was that every so often in semi-automatic mode BBs wouldn't come out consistently or reliably. Um, it would seem to misfeed. The first bit of troubleshooting was just strip it apart, clean it, lubricate it, and found that it, it improved it a little bit, but not by a huge amount. As time went on, that problem kind of got worse, and then I discovered that the nozzle return spring in the... Uh, if I can just point this out here. The nozzle return spring, so this is the nozzle. Nozzle return springs were broken, so the nozzle wasn't coming back, and... I thought, oh, well, there's a part that's broken. Maybe that's the problem. Then I replaced them, and it actually made the problem worse. It went from like a, a 50 to a 60 percent, you know, misfeed, all the way down to like a zero, sorry, like a hundred percent misfeed. So, you know, depending on how much gas was in the mag, I'd get some but not all the BBs out each shot, um, and sometimes it would feed two BBs into the hop up and the barrel so there'd be like a BB in the hop and then a BB right outside the hop and you get two BBs going out but at significantly diminished power. Um, this is apparently a not uncommon problem with the uh, KWMP9s. Now there have been a lot of suggestions out there like oh change the uh, tension on the nozzle disconnector spring, change this, change that. Um, I think it all boils down to the way this gun cycles. So I'm going to start pulling this apart and digging straight into it. Uh, and if you've never disassembled the KWA MP9, you can look at the manuals on the KWA website. Fairly straightforward parts tray. So. Let me drop that. Make it easier. Guide rod and spring. All right. So we're into the guts of this thing now. Let me just get this in the view of the other camera. All right. Cool. So the way this gun works is this bolt travels back. I'll do it this way and try and make it brighter. All right, so cycling operation of this gun, seated fully forward, trigger is pulled, hammer drops forward. That hits the gas release valve, which then feeds gas into the nozzle, which then starts to push the BB out, and it also pushes the piston on the cylinder backwards and it causes the bolt to move back. As the bolt's moving back, you see that it's locked the hammer back. And then at a certain point, this nozzle disengages from the hop-up rubber and the hop-up, or sorry, the uh, cylinder return spring would pull this backwards into the retracted position. Um, at this point it's reached the end of its travel and the momentum pushing this bolt backwards has subsided the um, the spring is going to push this back in this direction as it's feeding it'll seed a new BB and one of the other things that's going on here is uh, when you um, when you uh, have this 
trigger held back so you can see the uh, trigger bars pulled all the way back. When this disconnector isn't uh, pulled forward, it's not going to release the uh, the hammer. So in semi-automatic mode, right, it won't release that hammer till this disconnector is seated again. So let's just simulate a firing cycle. Pull the trigger, well, cock it first. Pull the trigger, hammer goes forward. Cylinder comes back. Recoil starts. That disconnector hasn't been pulled forward yet. And then the spring seats it, it goes into battery, right? Now it's reset, now that the disconnector is pulled forward, and you can fire again. So to re uh, just give a few reference for parts, and that's the hammer, that's the disconnector, that's the disconnector spring back here. Uh, you can see I'm just kind of pushing against it gently here. And I have tried stretching this out. So a couple things were happening all at the same time uh, that were muddying the waters. First off, in response to the whole, you need to stretch your disconnector spring out, it's a yes and a no. All the forum posts I've seen out there say, yes, you need to do this, but they don't really give a why. So there's a, a series of different causes that all feed back to, eventually, the hop-up rubber is causing issues. Um, when I had disassembled this, I was waiting for parts for about four weeks. Um, I guess the hop-up rubber kind of deformed and it got a little worse because it didn't have the nozzle constantly seated against it. So in its natural state, right, this spring has a certain amount of uh, force with its spring constant, and when the bolt was sitting forward, it actually didn't have enough force to push this disconnector into the forward position. And even if it was pushed forward, it wasn't completely seated forward, right? Um, like, that is fully seated forward. When you have the recoil, not the recoil, but, but the momentum of this spring fully seating it forward, there's only so much more distance that this can travel. You can see here, right? Watch that disconnector. It, it can barely travel forward at all because the cylinder is fully seated against the hop-up rubber. But when I had reassembled this the first time, it was sitting somewhere about here. Um, there was still a fair amount of travel in that disconnector and half the time I wasn't able to pull the trigger and get a shot off because that disconnector wasn't fully seating. So I guess the long storage time um, of the parts disassembled caused this spring to kind of win out because in its natural state this spring is pushing in this direction, this spring is pulling in that direction, uh, but I guess over time one of the springs changed. So I did stretch this out a little and it fixed that problem. So now my trigger pulls were actually causing the BBs to fire each time I pulled the trigger because the disconnector was actually working. That is one of multiple problems that came up with this. Um, so, now that that's explained, let's dive a little deeper. Ultimately, all your problems end up going to that hop-up bucking. But, let's just start the disassemblage. I'm going to do it this way because I'm used to doing it in this direction. Alright, so more problems. Um, I was also finding that my uh, when I reassembled this, I'm going to try and replicate this because I couldn't seem to replicate it consistently. Um, for whatever reason, the uh, bolt lock wasn't... Uh, that's the best way to describe it. The bolt lock was far too um, Hmm. Not sure what the right way to refer to this is, but effectively the spring in this magazine pushing up wasn't enough to overcome the force of this spring. What had happened was um, there's a spring here responsible for this action and for some reason the um, the other 
side of this coiled spring had protruded. It was slightly proud of this surface. Right now I can run this piece of metal straight across and it's not catching, but when I started to reassemble it, this was ever so slightly proud. Let's see if you can see that on camera, maybe not. Maybe, not really. Either way, what had happened was it was sitting proud and interfering with this piece of plastic. Um, and effectively, it increased the amount of force on this. All you need to do is just make sure it's completely flush and then you're okay. Symptom of this uh, phenomenon is if you try and seat the bolt catch group and it doesn't want to sit flat and you push it down and it wants to spring back up. You push it down and it wants to spring back up. Just double check that it's flush here. You don't have to snip it, just you know, push it down with a screwdriver and you should be good. From my experience anyways. I'm not an expert at this, I just do this enough. Alright, so now we're into the bolt group itself. Let's set the body of this aside. Um, for those that are unfamiliar, we have the, oops, you have the outer barrel, the inner barrel assembly, so if you ever have to change that hideous orange outer, this is where you do it, you gotta pu push some drive pins out. There will be no problems with this piece unless you've taken a uh, nose dive into the dirt. Um, this is the outer, sorry, this is the inner barrel where your hop-up is, uh, and you can see here there's quite a bit of wear, um, and it's kind of deformed quite a bit, so problems are laying in there. And here is the actual bolt itself. So in this instance, the nozzle return springs are uh, actually removed. They're not broken in this case because I've already gone in and out of this like five times. What I've done is I've just taken them out for now, what I'm going to do next is replace the hop-up. I don't have one right now, it'll be a follow-on video. But I'll kind of explain what's happening. So, from the underside, right, um, when the hammer on the uh, gun itself strikes the gas release valve on the magazine, gas goes in this port, and it does two things simultaneously the gas pushes the BB out and there's this little silver piece here, it's a floating valve. That floating valve will get pushed shut by the gas flow and prevent more gas from traveling down the barrel. Um, for those of you with CQB bolts, this valve has additional restrictions to reduce the amount of gas going out. Changing the gas pressure, like if you have an HPA setup, changing the pressure typically won't reduce your FPS, it'll just cause your gun uh, to fail to cycle properly. Um, you need to change that uh, flow valve here. So, BB comes out, and then at the same time, now I'm going to hold this still because this isn't moving. The bolt is, right? This is going to start to travel back, and at a certain point, the nozzle will disengage from the hop-up rubber because it's held in by friction. Show that again it disengages. Ordinarily, cylinder return springs would pull this back, it would reach the end of its travel, it would start to come forward again. Uh, this little protrusion here, show it from a side view, um, that protrusion, you can see that there with the contrast of the metal, that is what's actually pushing the BB up the feed ramp. In fact, if I yank the good old bolt carrier group. Maybe I can simulate this. I'll just do this. Easy peasy. That is what the, uh, I'll hold it upright. That is the feed ramp for the BB to get pushed up and into the rubber. Try and show a couple profile shots here because it's all grays and browns and blacks. And I'm on a dark background as well so it's kind of difficult to see. Um, what I really should do is just grab a BB and show you. Fortunately, like a cooking show, I just happen to have a, a bunch of BBs already prepared in advance. So, BB sitting there, and then the nozzle is going to push this up the ramp and into the bucking, and it gets seated right about there. Um, disassembling this partially again. 
and I'm going to reassemble this partially. Alright, so, watching from this direction, no, from that direction, I'm going to try and show as many views as I can. Um, as the bolt comes back into battery, it makes contact with that BB and it pushes it into its seating position. It makes an air seal with the rubber and that's as far as it goes. It doesn't go any further. Um, if I were to pull back on this, you'll see that the BB really hasn't been pushed in at all. That is as far as it goes. So, what's the problem? Let's assemble this again. My theory to this is that the friction between the rubber and the nozzle, when it's too low, the nozzle gets disengaged prematurely. So, let's pretend we actually have nozzle return springs here. Hammer gets struck, gas valve is actuated, gas starts to get applied in this direction. Pressure builds up, and instead of the hop-up, uh, that's sorry, the, the hop-up rubber and the nozzle staying engaged, pushing the BB down the barrel, the pressure actually starts to push this back and the nozzle comes disengaged from the rubber. So the gas just vents into the body of the gun and while you may get some movement from the cylinder, any gas that's coming through the nozzle is just going to vent into open air because it's no longer seated on that uh, rubber. It's just a, a coefficient of friction thing. It's just a wear and tear thing. Um, this rubber has been relatively uh, worn out. It's been used quite a bit. I think it's a very consumable part and it's just never mentioned how, how often you need to replace it. Um, and I think that if you keep it disassembled for a long period of time, that causes your rubber to deform and change shape. So the symptom of what was happening was as soon as I pull the trigger, you got a bit of gas and this would pop loose. And then the nozzle return spring would push that back um, as this was starting to cycle. And you wouldn't get enough gas to send the BB out. You would just get a, a second BB fed in right behind it. And you'd get a partial cycle again and another BB fed in behind it. Sooner or later you'd have like 10 BBs in the tube. One second. Um... So, my theory here again is you need to just need to replace the rubber and improve the friction between the cylinder and the rubber. Um, I tried progressively reducing the number of nozzle return springs. I had replaced both of them. I got the worst performance out of this gun I'd ever seen. Eventually, I tried taking one of the springs out. I got better performance, I'd get more BBs actually being fired. As time went on, I went, okay, well, if taking one out made it better, let's try taking two out. I took both out. And I got almost perfect performance out of the gun in semi-auto only. When I went to full auto, um, I, I basically got no BBs being fed. I actually... Um, I couldn't get BBs pushed into the, the hop-up fast enough. So there is a combination of nozzle return spring, um, spring constant trying to pull this nozzle back, and for lack of a better term, stiction between the hop-up rubber and the nozzle that need to stay in balance. And as soon as the tolerances on the hop-up rubber wear out, the 
nozzle return springs overwhelm the friction that's there and your gas just dissipates. So I think that's the root cause that causes a lot of problems. Um, while your uh, disconnector spring has some to do with it, I don't think it's that much. Um, you can clean and lubricate this thing to death and back. It really won't change anything. Uh, I think when in doubt, your cylinder itself um, probably won't wear out that quickly, but your nozzle is prone to uh, deformations. It's prone to, I guess, being torn or shredded up. If you have a, a cracked BB that feeds in and you get sharp edges of plastic feeding down here, um, I, I think the rubber just is a little bit softer and needs to be replaced because, I mean, it, it's very asymmetrical if you look at it from a, a square on perspective. It does not look very happy. So I think that's it. Um, there will be a follow on video. And I will attempt to replace that uh, pop-up in the future as soon as I can get those parts in. It's the middle of the pandemic, it's a little hard to get parts right now in any timely manner. Um, so for now, I'm just going to clean and reassemble this thing. And if you're here looking for answers on your MP9, you can probably stop now. But otherwise, you can just kind of hang around while I reassemble this stuff. It's only been about 20 minutes, and yes, it's been a bit incoherent and rambling, so I guess let's clean and reassemble. I got these lovely swabs. Um, when I'm teching, I'll use this Airsoft Innovations oil, um, but I'm in the process of trying to reverse engineer what the oil itself is, and not just reverse engineer by guessing, but I've actually had um, a colleague of mine run some proton and carbon NMRs. I'm a former process chemist, so I have, you know, peripheral access to half a million dollar equipment, which is kind of cool. Um, one of the three components in this appears to be good old cyclomethicone, which is a cosmetics grade silicone oil. You can get it from various places. It's a very lightweight, um, low viscosity silicone, and I'm just going to apply liberally, but not soak the workbench in it. And it does have a somewhat high boiling point, but low evaporation point, for lack of a better term. Basically, the heat of vaporization of this stuff is relatively low. It's like heptane. It may boil at 98 degrees C, but if you leave a beaker of heptane and a beaker of water on the table, the heptane is going to evaporate faster because there's very little heat of vaporization involved. Um, but yeah, I haven't given this thing a, an intensive clean. I've just kind of cleaned all the major moving parts. Um, I will eventually figure out what the formula of that particular silicone oil is because it's the one that just seems to work for me and I will probably try and open source it in some manner, maybe on GitHub or something, I don't know, uh, along with the NMRs and the data to support my conclusions. All right, that group's cleaned up. Hmm, can I like, no, I can't. One major downside I found with um, airsoft guns is a lot of this is made out of uh, cast zinc or cast and machine zinc, and there's not a lot of strength behind it. This stuff wears pretty quickly, and just because of the material properties, you can't solder, you can't weld, you can't repair lost metal. You can only replace the part. Um, personally, I would pay good money for a high quality steel bolt and push comes to shove one day I may just cat up and have custom machined a steel bolt for this thing um, yeah I've already cleaned this quite a bit so there's only a bit of dirt from the most recent tests got to clean behind here too 
just because this uh, flap is constantly running against the hammer, so that's always going to get dirty. I do not need to clean and lubricate that because silicone oil on the hop is a bad thing. Um, I can run a barrel cleaning patch down through that, but I'm not going to just now. So let's deal with this. Make sure the disconnector and everything else is good and lubed. To quote the uh, AVE channel, there's two types of situations. A little dab will do you, or the bigger the gob, the better the job. Uh, this is one of those latter situations. More lubricant is better because it helps clear away contaminants that cause friction and poor cycling of the gun. <clears throat> Plus it helps protect uh, from moisture and oxidation. Uh, let's just do that and then there. And get all the crap from under the hammer assembly and get all sides of the hammer. Yeah, I'm starting to get some gunk out of there. There's a rubber uh, impact pad to absorb and dampen the shock of that bolt coming backwards. It doesn't hurt to keep it lubricated, I suppose. Um, silicone won't attack natural butyl based rubbers, whereas um, conventional alkane hydrocarbon solvents or lubricants will. Uh, especially aromatic solvents like uh, benzenes, toluenes, xylenes, they will eat butyl rubber up, but uh, silicone oil won't, and it actually kind of helps keep it from uh, not drying and cracking out, but it's actually uh, butyl rubbers degrade by oxidation um, because they have a bunch of double bonds. We're getting into some chemistry now. The double bonds actually um, turn into single bonds as oxidants such as uh, nitrous, or nitrogen oxides, so, uh, sulfur oxides, and ozone um, attack those double bonds in the, um, in the rubber. When that happens, the rubber becomes less flexible. It's more flexible when it's got double bonds in it, and as those double bonds get oxidized away, it gets brittle and cracks easily. Um, Keeping it liberally doused in silicone oil just helps prevent oxidants, oxidants from getting to that rubber. It will eventually oxidize, and this part's eventually going to be a consumable, but for the time being, I think I can reassemble this thing now. Lock that hammer back, reassemble my outer inner barrel, reassemble the bolt to that. Cool. Let us put that there and align that. Um, it does not want to go down right. Oh, I think I had it right. <laughs> Demo syndrome. I'm live on the internet. This is when everything goes terribly, terribly wrong. Yeah, why the frick is everything going wrong right now? Oh, yeah. It helps if I don't assemble it upside down. Duh. Um, this took me a while to figure out when I was first learning to reassemble the MP9. You gotta push this disconnector forward. All right, it cycles correctly. Let's lock that barrel back into place. It's funny. Of all the steel parts on here, this is steel. I guess it makes sense. It's a little more durable. Alright. So we're going to pull this backwards. Get that seated. And all the way down. Alright. That is secured. Alright. That works. Reassemble the guide rod and the spring. And try not to launch this thing across the room like I've never done that before. Also, a good point to not get my finger caught. Do a function check before I close it up. It works. So, put that guy back on. 
push the pin in until it locks, tug up on this to make sure it's actually locked, and I can just put this screw back in. Now, some ain't seen, right? Murphy's Law. You know, I could put this thing back together like 20 times while troubleshooting it, but as soon as I'm live streaming, everything goes to pot. Alright, that's in. This is in. Reassemble it. So, uh, when in doubt, order spare parts, um, gas blowback, submachine guns, and uh, gas blowback airsoft guns in general are a labor of love. Parts wear out, especially because of the style and design. Um, a lot of zinc parts rubbing on one another, pot metal parts rubbing on one another. Um, stuff wears out very quickly. Tolerances change. Um, all that black uh, or gray stuff that you clean out of your gun is metal particulate. Um, like, I actually, I forgot to bring this out in the video, but I actually carry a box of spare parts for all my airsoft guns in my main gear bag, even down to things like spare followers, um, you know, electrical connectors, but um, these are my MP9 parts. I have a spare um, piston head spare nozzle return springs, some of which went in here and they didn't work for me so I took them back out and put them back in the parts kit. Um, so I think I'm just going to order a spare cylinder uh, and a, a couple spare hop-up rubbers um, and just keep them sealed in the packaging because that's the only way to really, you know, make it work. Uh, so yeah, at the very least, with no nozzle return spring, and a worn out hop up rubber, you can get um, semi automatic performance working enough to carry you through an airsoft game, especially if it crops up in the middle of a, a multi day event. You know, being able to figure out what's going on and then changing your playstyle and taking it off of uh, full auto will carry you through the event. Um, but having the spare parts and just being able to say, okay, when I go for my lunch break while I'm digesting food and before I start, you know, sucking wind again, I'm just going to strip this thing apart, rebuild it, and away we go. Um, so yeah, I think that's this video in a nutshell. Um, just trying to think if there's anything else. Probably not. Um, I guess for comparison's sake... Uh, where is it? My, uh... Airsoft WeTech Glock with a uh, PL Mini light on it. Um, same problems, also the gun is clear, there's no magazine. Um, same problems, a lot of parts are zinc and any parts that are rubbing are just going to end up slowly giving that gray-black um, dirt. It's not really dirt that builds up, it is worn, worn off metal. Um, certain parts are steel, certain parts are aluminum, and certain parts are zinc. Um, so, I mean, I've got a, I think it's called garter. Um, it's called a zero hammer, for lack of a better term. It's effectively a segmented roller. And instead of being a ball bearing roller, it is actually a, it's still on a bearing, it's just not as nice of a bearing, and there's a bit more friction. Um, it's flat to minimize the force required to drop that hammer, or rather the resistance of this sliding backwards. It does seem to help, um, but it does require a little bit of fine tuning. And actually, my pro tip on that is you can take a fine emery uh, nail file. I believe this is like 2,000 grit on this side and something like 400 grit on this side. Um, when it comes, it feels like it's 200 something grit sandpaper, like 240 grit sandpaper. You take it down with 400, and then you take it down with 2,000 until it's like a mirror finish. And is it smooth like butter? Um, 
it's still not perfect. It's not like a uh, it's not like a very well tuned high kappa where you can get good quality parts and spend like five hundred dollars on a pistol. But I mean, I reliably I reliably can power stroke it, and it just works. If you lower it slowly, you still can get that hammer lock up. Um, but this is only going to happen when you've got like zero gas left in the magazine, or if you fire very, very quickly, dumping too much gas and causing that magazine to cool down. Um, so yeah, gas guns in general, you just got to lubricate, clean, and maintain the living daylights out of them, and you'll be good to go. Um, either that, or you buy one of those new hotness um, uh, VFC Sig M uh, M17s, the P320 M17, get a CO2 magazine for it, lubricate it frequently, but if it's designed to withstand a CO2 magazine, the gun is a lot sturdier. Um, from my experience, any gun like this one, this is another airsoft gun, gun is clear. Um, actually, no, I need to keep that up. Uh, any CO2 designed airsoft gun is going to be designed with a bit more robust metal behind it. Um, while the slide here is what appears to be cast zinc, um, more of these parts are actually held in and retained by plates of steel. Some of the wear surfaces are steel. Um, some of the impact surfaces either have a little rubber damper behind them or they are steel. So that the, the worst of it is handled by steel and not by zinc. Uh, same on this part, I think. Actually, I can check this with a magnet real quick. Okay, now that's zinc, but some of that is definitely, whoops, steel. Oh, Murphy's Law. Also, look at the recoil spring on this friggin' uh, uh oh, am I missing a part? Uh oh. Well, I think that might end that video because now I've got to find where the other part of this assemblage is because there was another part to this, I think. Oh, no, 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 I'm just forgetting how to reassemble this stinking gun because I don't use it enough. This is the Taurus P99. It's like an M, uh, M9 or an M92 FS style Beretta, except it's the airsoft version that has full auto, so it's got the fun switch. Um, I'll just put this thing back together. Bugger it all. Let's try that. Yeah. So, gas guns in general, things that are designed to handle CO2, like this one, uh, way better in terms of build quality from my experience, like material selection. Um, this guy is not designed to handle CO2, it's designed for green gas, there's a lot of zinc parts, and the hop-up rubber wears out. So, stay tuned for a follow-up video and we'll see where things go. And, uh, yeah, I can't wait for this pandemic to be over so I can go to a field, and if they'll allow the fun switch, safe, semi-auto. Hold it down till it's empty. Alright, that's it for today. Peace out.